Hello! Um, last week we talked about the blood supply to the large bowel, uh, which was interesting because of some anastomoses and the watershed area and what that means for um, patients. So this week we should talk about the venous drainage from the bowel because if you know where the blood goes to from most of the gastrointestinal tract, you'll know that it's a little different, similar but a little different and that means we will also talk about one of the portosystemic anastomoses and the anatomy that explains it, all right? So, let's use this very helpful torso model. The blood of the large bowel, well, the large, most of the um, stuff that we absorb is in, absorbed by the small intestine, the large intestine, under here, the large bowel, um, is absorbing water, compacting the feces and some vitamins and other bits and bobs get absorbed there. Um, so the blood from the large bowel and the small bowel containing those absorbed nutrients and other bits and bobs will travel first to the liver and that blood will go through the liver, through tiny microscopic channels in the liver into the inferior vena cava and then the inferior vena cava uh, will take that blood back to the heart and off around the body, right? So when we talk about venous drainage of the bowel, including the large bowel, we must consider the liver. Um, but first of all, let's, <laughs> we do this backwards. Whenever I think about blood flow, I think about arteries going to organs from the heart, and I think about veins coming from organs back to the heart. So I'm always gonna, try and describe the blood from the large bowel backwards, right? Um, here's the small bowel here. If I take out the small bowel, I should be able to keep the large bowel in place. And a reminder of the parts of the large bowel, or the large intestine, of which, of which the colon is a part. Uh, here, we, find, we see the small intestine, the last part of the ileum, passing into the cecum. So the contents are passing in this direction. Here's the cecum, that blind-ended pouch, the star of the large bowel, and then the ascending colon passes up here, and then we have the right colic flexure, where we have this angle change, which is at the side of the liver, so also gets called the hepatic flexure. And then we have the transverse colon, and then the left colic flexure, this next angle change, on the side of the spleen, so this is the splenic flexure, both terms get used interchangeably, right? And then we have the descending colon, and we see this lovely wiggle. Oh good, we can see, look, we can see the veins in the arteries here. We have this lovely wiggle, this little S shape, so that's the sigmoid colon. And the sigmoid colon is taking the tube posteriorly, where it will become the rectum and pass down through the pelvis and become the anal canal which is the last part of the gastrointestinal tract, and we have the anal aperture there. There's a whole other video on that. So we're interested in the blood supply, or rather the venous drainage from this. All right, well, when we were looking at the arterial supply, I said the blood was supplied by two arteries, the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery. So how does that correspond to the venous drainage? Well, there is a superior mesenteric vein and there is an inferior mesenteric vein. Now, if I just take off the transverse colon so we can see a little bit better, we see some looping veins draining blood from the ileum and the cecum, or the first part of the colon. So here we have the ileocolic vein and we have a right colic vein draining blood from the ascending colon, and we have a middle colic vein draining blood from the transverse colon, and those three veins come together, uh, drain into the superior mesenteric vein, which is also draining blood from the small bowel. So we're looking here, right? Um, we have the duodenum, and we have the pancreas. So look how this vein passes anterior to this part of the duodenum here, and then passes posterior to the pancreas to get deep, but it's not going to the inferior vena cava. Um, if I turn this around, that's what we're looking at here. 
So we've got three veins here. That's the splenic vein, draining blood from the spleen. Um, and then we have the inferior mesenteric vein there and the superior mesenteric vein there, right? So there's the superior mesenteric vein passing between the duodenum and the pancreas. Turn that around. There it is again. There's the, the pancreas there. There's the superior mesenteric vein. Now, they will all come together and form this vein here, the hepatic portal vein, which is going to run to the liver, hepatic. It's a portal vein because this is a vein that's not running from an organ back to the heart. It's running from one organ, the gut, to a second organ, the liver. So it's a portal vein, and then it's running back to the heart. It's such a significant and common portal vein that it often just gets called the portal vein when people are working in the abdomen. But the hepatic portal vein refers to this specific vein. So, um, the ileocolic vein, right colic vein, middle colic vein are draining to the superior mesenteric vein. And then across on the other side, we're, oh, it's going over there, isn't it? Um, we have the left colic vein draining the descending colon. We have sigmoidal veins draining blood from the sigmoid colon. And then, hmm, I guess it's going to be the last branch there. We have a superior rectal vein, or maybe a couple of superior rectal veins. Um, when we look at the arteries supplying blood to the large bowel, they are a little variable. Uh, veins love to be a little bit more variable than the arteries, so expect some variation here. But you can see that the veins often match the arterial supply. And last time when we looked at the arterial supply, we talked about the marginal artery of Drummond, which is feeding smaller arteries to the bowel. Look how there is a, another vein matching the marginal arteries. There is a vein running parallel with the edge of the large bowel, collecting veins from the large bowel, and then draining that blood, feeding that blood into the, these, these colic veins. Hmm. So the left colic vein, the sigmoidal veins, the superior rectal vein or veins are draining into the inferior mesenteric vein. Um, so those parts of the bowel draining blood using those veins um, which includes the splenic flexure and the left third of the transverse colon. So that part of the bowel corresponds to the embryonic hindgut, whereas the remainder of the large bowel corresponds to the embryonic midgut, which the small bowel is also part of. Anyway, if we follow these veins back and we track them through up here and we see that inferior mesenteric vein, and I turn this around. Um, that's what we're seeing here. Um, so the inferior mesenteric vein then is going to drain into the splenic vein. The splenic vein will meet with the superior mesenteric vein, and then that will become the hepatic portal vein. The hepatic portal vein is then running next to the bile duct in the free edge of the lesser omentum here, that double peritoneal sheet linking the stomach and the liver. Um, and the hepatic portal vein will be taking blood into the liver and it will divide into left and right and then all that blood will flow through microscopic channels in the liver, which will then get passed into the inferior vena cava, back into the heart and off around the body. Simples, is there any more? Mm, yes, there is, yeah, there's a bit more. We can see that these veins are draining the large bowel, right? Um, and here, if I take all the bowel off, we can see the posterior abdominal wall, and we can see the inferior vena cava, which has not yet reached the level of the liver, right? Uh, the inferior vena cava is formed by the left and right common iliac veins. The left and right common iliac veins are formed by the external and internal iliac veins. And the internal iliac vein is a vein from the pelvis, draining blood from pelvic structures. In the pelvis, we can see it a little bit more clearly now, is the rectum and the anal canal. And I said that the superior rectal vein is draining blood from the rectum. So, 
superior parts of the rectum, and that's draining blood to the inferior mesenteric vein, and the blood is going to the liver, through the liver, right, to get back to the inferior vena cava. Now, there is a middle rectal vein and there is an inferior rectal vein. The middle rectal vein is going to drain to the internal iliac vein in the pelvis, and the uh, inferior rectal vein is going to drain blood to the internal pedendal vein, which will then drain to the internal iliac vein. So that blood from the lower part of the rectum and the anal canal is going to drain back to the internal iliac vein, common iliac vein, and uh, inferior vena cava and back to the heart. All well and good. Naturally, uh, veins being veins, there is a rectal venous plexus in the rectum and the anal canal linking all of those veins, which means that the superior rectal vein, middle rectal vein, and inferior rectal vein are linked. They're doing their own thing normally, but there is a possibility that blood could take an alternate route if it needed to, right? So, in the case of chronic liver disease, for example, liver cirrhosis, the liver is very good at regenerating. Um, there are some famous old tales about about that sort of thing. Um, but if the liver keeps regenerating, it does tend to make more uh, collagen, more connective tissue within it. It becomes more fibrous inside the liver. And I said that the liver is filled with microscopic channels that the blood from the gut passes through to get to the inferior vena cava. Now, if the liver becomes very fibrous, it becomes harder for that blood to flow through those microscopic channels. The resistance to flow goes up. Now, because of the pressures involved, the blood is going to prefer to take the route of least resistance, right? To get back to the heart. So it's possible then that with long-term liver disease, with fibrosis of the liver, blood that is finding it difficult to get through the liver will instead find its way through the rectal venous anastomosis, also known as the hemorrhoid, sorry, the rectal venous plexus, also known as the hemorrhoidal plexus. Um, so blood can flow through the superior rectal vein into the middle and probably inferior rectal veins and then back to the internal iliac vein, common iliac vein, inferior vena cava and get back to the heart because there's less resistance there. This is all well and good. But uh, veins don't have a, a muscular wall like arteries do. So with that increased flow, it's likely those veins will become distended. They will become varices. Um, and the blood vessels in the rectum and anal canal have important roles to play. Like I said, there's a whole other video on that. It's a very interesting set of anatomy in there. But if those veins uh, become distended because they've been taking more blood flow for a long period of time, then they will form hemorrhoids. Now, if somebody has hemorrhoids, it does not mean that they have liver disease. But if someone has liver disease, they may develop hemorrhoids. There are other causes of hemorrhoids, right? Um, and this is one of five portosystemic anastomoses. Um, I'm sure I've talked about them all somewhere else. But if we're gonna talk about the venous drainage of the bowel, um, we need to mention them, right? But there you go. That is how the blood of the large bowel is returned to the systemic circulation through the liver. Um, okay, I hope it was useful. It certainly bookends last week's arterial supply to the large bowel. See you next week. I'm, I'm sure I can think of another topic for next week. Mm -hmm.